Okay, you ready for tonight? Well, let's just pray. Father, just help me communicate uh, what is on your heart tonight to your precious people. Father, your word is so precious. Father, we esteem it highly. Father, we honor you and we're in fear of you, reverential awe of you this night as we open up the precious word of God. Father, we thank you that it is alive. It is quick. It is powerful. It is moving into the hearts and minds of your people tonight to bring transformation and to bring you glory. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I, uh, yeah, I'm going to go through a few just highlighted things I felt um, that I, I would share for tonight. And uh, I started preparing this a couple of weeks ago. There's so much stuff t- that I could probably cover, but I felt like going back to some of these areas because I felt there were just highlights in terms of the, the worship warfare thing. And uh, I want to I wanna just read this incident here, and then we'll start to walk into the New Testament and start to make sense of it. And see that um, that God, the, the 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 area of worship is so powerful that there is there is a redemptive purpose in worship. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but but it is so powerful and it, it is so um, valuable to God that when you worship, God will v- will visit you in such a way that He will bring redemptive things. He will redeem things that's been lost that has gone in your life. And I'm going to. I'm going to prove this to you in Scripture right now. It is so precious to God. You know, this is why, um, this is why, for example, Jerusalem, you know, is so precious to God because it's a geographical spot that basically, uh, you know, God's people over the centuries have actually, it's a place of worship. Amen. So it can never be taken by anybody. But this is the reason why. Because God says, I've put my mark on that because my people actually worship there. And where my people have worshipped, I'll always revisit. Amen. Okay, let me, let me read this story. I don't know if you're, you probably are aware of the story, um, but I'll read it to you. And in my Bible, it's, it's highlighted the Dina incident. Now, Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. So she went out scouting around. She shouldn't have. And it says in verse 2, we're in uh, chapter 34 of uh, Genesis, it says, Now when Shechem, the son of Hamar the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, and he lay with her, and he violated her. So he raped her. So she went out to to spy out the land. She shouldn't have. And she she moved into the territory of Shechem. And so when uh, Shechem's uh, son saw her, um, the son of Hamar, sorry, Shechem, he, uh, he liked her, and he raped her. And so it was quite a big, quite a big thing. And, and so um, when uh, Jacob's uh, sons of, uh, heard of this, um, the sons were very upset that their sister had been raped. And so what they did was uh, two of them basically said, um, Simeon and, and Levi, uh, her brothers, two of them says, what we need to do is we need to go and visit these guys that raped our sister. I'm just give, paraphrasing it for you. We need to go and visit them. And uh, we need to bring our justice against them. So they went to them and he says, look, uh, you know, uh, this is a dreadful thing that happened. I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing it all. But they were basically saying this. They, they, uh, they deceived them. And they said to them, what we'll do is we will come into a covenant with you. If... Uh, it's okay, you know, we'll intermarry. You can have our, our daughters and we can marry your daughters and et cetera, et cetera. But um, we would like to come into a covenant with you because us Jews are circumcised and you guys are not. So they thought, well, that sounds pretty good. So um, they went into this covenant and it came, it says there in verse 25, it's all in there, you can read it. It's quite a fascinating story. But um, it says there that uh, on the, and it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain. So they circumcised the men in Shechem. And in the third day when they were in pain, the two of the, son, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. They killed all the men. They killed Hamar and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dina 
from Shechem's house and went out. Now, the important thing about this is the geography, because I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how God works uh, with geography. Um, very important to understand this. And so that happened at a place called Jacob's Well. Jacob's Well. Important to remember that. Took place the incident at Jacob's Well. Then uh, Jesus comes along, and uh, we'll pick it up in chapter 4. And uh, Jesus, it says in, in verse 4, he needed to go through Samaria because he wanted to meet this Samaritan woman. Amen. So he goes through Samaria. And, uh, and it says, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Amen. It's the same spot, by the way, that Jesus met the Samaritan woman. Same spot where, you know, the sons had been killed by Simeon and Levi. Amen. So Jesus comes along and he starts to speak. And you know the background. I won't get into the whole background about it. But, um, you know, there's a dialogue between Jesus and this woman. And it says he needs to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria. But the point is that Jesus went out of his way to teach on worship. That's a big statement right there. He went out of his way to teach on worship because he was going to teach this woman on worship. So we'll pick it up. Verse 16, Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. The women answered him and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, uh, you have well said, for you have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The women said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, this here, this whole story, if you know the story, what Jesus was actually offering her was a marriage proposal. It was a marriage proposal. He was basically saying he came to this particular woman. He had to meet this particular woman. And he was basically saying to her, you've, you've, you've known five men already, and now you're with another man. And uh, you've never met the right man. I would like to introduce you to the last man you'll ever have to meet. Amen. <laughs> and it's basically me. Amen. But the, but the, the, the way this is written, the, 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 the Greek and the Jews understood that this was like a marriage proposal. Amen. A lot of these things happened at the well. Things were significant at wells, as I mentioned in the first session. Amen. So he's basically saying, lady, what you need, you need to be married to God. Amen. Come on, we are the bride of Christ. Is, it, is you here? Yeah. Is anybody here? Just help me, people. You know, we are the bride of Christ, right? So, so we're in a marriage relationship with God. Isn't that right? So that's what Jesus was offering, was a marriage proposal to this woman. So remember, it's at Jacob's well. And then, um, and then she, goes into, she, she goes into this geography thing, and she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, Women, believe me, the hour is coming when neither you shall worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you do not know what, but we know what we worship for our salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh in now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. So he starts to introduce her to the Father. And uh, he talks about God as a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, this is the most exciting part. makes everything sensible. It makes sense now. One verse makes a lot of sense. It says, then the woman left her. So, so when she heard about worship from Jesus, she dropped basically her water pot. And she ran to tell the men of the city. She didn't tell the women. She went to tell the men of the city. Amen. Same spot where one woman, Dina's rash actions to go into an area she shouldn't have gone in, and it ended up with all the men being killed. One woman's actions, a Samaritan woman, her actions caused the men of the city to be redeemed. <laughs> Amen. So there's, there's redemption, there's, there's, there's redemption here in this story. So, so God redeemed a harvest where injustice was practiced. This is a point I want to make. God will redeem a harvest where injustice was practiced. 
And worship is a catalyst for all of this. When the women had a revelation, there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening in this I don't have time to get into, but when the women had a revelation of worship, God used her to bring justice in that geographical area where injustice had already been done. Amen? So God is not slack. He knows areas. He knows what's happened in those areas, and then he'll use people to bring justice where injustice was previously done. But the other thing that's important is this woman, she went and evangelized the city. She went and said to the men, you've got to go and listen to this guy. I've just met this man. He's told me everything. You better go meet him. And so she had a, basically a gift of evangelism. So what happened is worship, the message of worship. It's interesting. She didn't fall down on her knees and worship Jesus when she heard the message from God himself, right? She, she actually went to the city and she, she, the, the gift that was inherent in her that she'd never used before, the gift of evangelism, was sparked off just like that. Oh, come on now. So what, what worship can do is worship will, will, will activate gifts in your life that, that have lain dormant. Amen? That's what it will do because worship is the most important thing to God. So I thought that was interesting. So I said to you on Friday, and we're, we're going to go in and out of this a little bit, that um, a lot of, and I want to go through this quickly, a lot of warfare that we experience can actually be avoided. That doesn't mean that we don't stand. You know, Ephesians 6 tells us that. Uh, you know, I put on the armor of God every morning as I go for my walk. So I do that. I'm very familiar with that. So I'm not saying that we don't do that. I'm saying we must do that. But a lot of the stuff that we go through, we blame the devil, and the devil says, I wasn't even close. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't bothered him for years. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> and yet we blame the devil. The devil gets blamed for everything. Um, and so a lot of the stuff we bring upon ourselves, but a lot of it <clears throat> that people, good Christian people go through, they can actually avoid by certain actions. I'm going to show you a couple of things tonight. So number one is this. This has been so powerful. Um, the way God has just um, reiterated this to me just in the last few weeks or months. And when I get something, I'll, I'll meditate on it until I really get hold of it. And, and it's this, that uh, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is something that if you practice, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens to you will stop. I'd love an enthusiastic amen. Just <laughs> so what is the fear of the Lord? This is whenever you read the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is the reverential worship and awe of Almighty God. It is, a, it is the place where you are absolutely in awe of God. Amen. It's the, it, the fear of God is the awe of God. Amen. And so, <clears throat> the, when the world is in the fear of the world system, the church is not going to be like that at all. The church is going to embrace the fear of God. And the fear of God will start to change everything in your life. And I'll show you just now. Listen to this here. I preached this in my church uh, probably a year ago, a year and a half ago, and uh, I was amazed when I started researching this. In Proverbs 19.23, just one verse, one verse, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. And then it makes this incredible statement, and I've given you a couple of translations here. It says, uh, he will abide in satisfaction who's got the fear of the Lord, and he will not... He will not, he will not be visited with evil. Amen. That is an incredible scripture, isn't it? When I saw that, I thought, whoa, let me just meditate on this. What does this mean? And God says, the, the, fe the fear of the Lord, when you fear me, and see, everything operates in the spirit realm. You know, we don't even know it, but, but everything operates in the spirit. The enemy is very aware of how you operate in the Spirit. He's very aware of your prayer. He's very, very aware of your worship. And there's certain things that we can do that actually we don't even talk to Him. <laughs> We're not even aware of Him. We're so caught up in the fear of God. We honor you so much, Lord. And in the Spirit realm, that is translated as 
Stop. Don't touch them. Don't get near them. Isn't that powerful? Let, let me show some of these other translations. It says in the Amplified Classic Bible, because I wanted to make sure I was getting this right, and I checked it out in the, in, the, in the Hebrew and stuff. But it says he cannot, he cannot be visited with actual evil. He cannot be. Who cannot be? The one who has the fear of God, who reveres God. Amen. The message trans translation, and this was the, my sermon title when I preached this, that uh, it was no nasty surprises. You will experience no nasty surprises. I love that, man. And then the Passion Translation says, continual protection, complete satisfaction. Continual protection, complete satisfaction. Amen. So, listen to this now. Um, and I'm just giving you a few examples because I wanted to highlight a few other areas tonight because of our time. But in Proverbs 10, 27, it says here, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. The message translation says the fear of God expands your life. The NIV says the fear of the Lord adds length to your life. So what does the fear of God do? The fear of God removes the fear of premature death. This is huge. The fear of the Lord removes the fear of premature death. Because a lot of Christians walk around and they hear stories of people dying and they don't know, you know, what it's all about. When I wrote that book, I had a good friend who died young, uh, Kim Clement. He was a good friend of mine. And, and it bothered me, you know. And I says, God, you know, I felt God asked me to write this book on worship and healing. And, uh, you know, when I was writing it, I was struggling. When I, you know, how do you write, how, you know, such a great man of God he was, and, and he died at 62, and I'm thinking, okay, and I felt I have to write this book, and so I'm struggling at the beginning, and I said to the Lord, you know, Lord, how do you, how do you, how do you explain this stuff? You know what I'm saying? Because everybody's got a story of someone they knew who was young, who loved God, and they died. We all have those stories, right? So I'm saying, how do you explain this kind of stuff when I do these worship heal seminars? How do I explain this? And I start off when I do that seminar saying this. I said, I struggle like everybody else struggles to understand certain things. And this was a biggie for me. It's why Christians would die prematurely. Because that's premature, right? We're supposed to be granted long life. Amen. So I'm struggling with this. I'm just sharing with you from my heart. I'm struggling with this, this whole idea. How, do, how does one explain this? And the Lord said this clearly to me. He says, Tom... Do not focus on the things that you don't understand. Focus on the things that you do understand. And I says, okay, what do I understand? He says, you understand what I have written in my word that I'll satisfy you with long life. Do you understand that, Tom? I said, yes, Lord. He says, well, focus on the things that you... Don't try and analyze situations that you have no idea of what was going on in the human heart or circumstances. You have not. So don't try and explain that. You'll never be able to explain that. But what you do have to do is to focus on the things that you do understand, which is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Just focus on that. So I thought that was great. But listen to this one because I, I kind of alluded to this this morning. I do another seminar called Raising a Generation of Worshippers where... I teach, I teach this young, younger generation pre from pregnant moms all the way through to teens, you know, how we've got to teach them the principles in God. But listen to this. These are some of the things I bring out. Proverbs 14, 26. These are scriptures you've probably all read, but when you meditate on them and you think, wow, wow, look at what he's actually saying here. And meditate and meditate and meditate until you actually get it, until it becomes alive in you. I often, you know, when I'm falling asleep at night, I'll often meditate on scriptures, just as I'm falling asleep, I'll go over them and 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 over them. And, over them. and uh, listen to this in Proverbs 14:26. These are things you should be underlining if you don't know them already. It says that the fear of the Lord secures protection for your children. The fear of the Lord secures protection for your children. Amen. Isn't that good? The message translation says. The fear of God builds up confidence and makes you and makes a world safe 
for your children. Amen. Let, let me, I'm going off track a little bit, but in that, that seminar, what I do for, um, for, for raising a generation of worshipers, I say this, I say a lot of the time, a lot of the time, the, thing, the things that happen to your children is basically our own fault. And I don't say it in a negative way, but it's true. And we have to deal with these issues. Because a lot of times, and, and I've had to deal with it myself, and I'm sure Barbara has as well, a lot of times when you're, grow, you're, you're raising children, the enemy will always come with the lies. They're going to go off track. They're going to have accidents. They're going to have a terrible sickness. This is going to happen at school. That's, so you're bombarded with stuff, right? Amen. Does anybody have, can relate to any of that stuff? Or maybe you don't get this in New Zealand. I'm not, not sure. But I'm sure you do, right? And so, you're bomb so, 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 so here's the key. Here's where the whole thing starts. So the children don't understand that most of the time. But you understand the principles. Amen. So unless you take authority over the, that kind of fear that something negative is going to happen to your children, you're the one that God makes responsible to take authority over that. Not the children. And you have to do that. You bind those thoughts the very instant they come into your mind. And then you quote the scriptures regarding long life. You've got to do that. And so what happens is there's a protection that takes place. And so a lot of the times it's the fear that the parents carry. I know that's a hard truth. But it's the fear that the parents carry that causes the problem with the children. Amen. Because they're innocent. They don't know. But if you're carrying fear, you will open up a door. So highlights, as I said, highlights to protect you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, I've taught this a lot. It says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, this is big as well. So practicing the will of God. Med I mean, meditating just on that one scripture. Watch what he's saying here. It's so profound. It says, in everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. Not for everything. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. So when things have gone crazy, when things are going crazy in your world, what are you supposed to do? In the midst of it, not for it, but in the midst of it, give God thanks. Because God says this. God says, Tom, if you can give me thanks, it's not just like we thank God. The, the rest of it is the important part. It says, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So when you're giving God thanks, what happens is at that moment that you're giving God thanks, you're actually inside the will of God. Everything else around you may be chaotic. But in that moment, what you're doing is you're building a foundation of being in the will of God. When you're in the will of God, the enemy can't touch you. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. He can't touch you. When you so, um, I, you know, there's times when you say, well, should I go to the left or should I go to the right? Should I immigrate here or should I go for a job there? And so you don't actually know. Is that right? You know, we, 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 we can be confused with that. So what do you do in a situation like that? I'm giving you practical stuff. So you say, okay, God, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I'm not sure whether I should take that job or move to that city or put the kids in this school or put the kids in that school. So what am I supposed to do? Okay, so you just say, Father, I'm going to give you thanks. And you connect the dots. You say, right now as I'm giving you thanks, I'm in your will. Therefore, if I'm in your will, you will lead me and guide me to the right place. You will lead me to make the right decisions. Oh, hallelujah. And when you make the right decisions, you're in a place of protection. It affects everything. Amen. It's so, but we, the, the, the scripture, I mean, it, the, this is the fear of God. The fear of God is not, is not being, it, it's not being, um, you know, lighthearted about the scripture. It's to take the scriptures like they are precious gems, like the Bible tells us, are more precious than, than, than gold and silver, right? It's to take them and say, okay, this scripture here, what is this scripture saying? God, did, did you mean what you said? He says, absolutely. I mean, I meant everything I said. Am I in your will and I'm doing it? Yes, I am. Well, if I'm in your will, I'm outside the will of the enemy. Now, you may have to go through that for days or even for weeks, but every day when there's confusion, you just thank God for it. You thank God for it. You thank God and you say, Father, I thank you. I'm in your will right now. I'm giving you thanks. In the midst of it, not for confusion. You don't bring that into it. Amen. You give him thanks. 
So that's a very powerful one. Now I'll give you another one. I'm just going through these quickly. Is that okay? Um, Ephesians 5.17 says, And do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here's another one for the will of the Lord. He's actually explaining. Let me explain to you. He's basically saying, let me explain to you what the will of the Lord is. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making, watch now, melody in your heart to the Lord. So he's saying, this is, again, this is my will for you, Tom. When you're going through some stuff, you know, you know, I want you to get back in my will again. So make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing to me. Amen. God values singing so much, so much. This is a big deal to God. These, everything God has instructed that you and I do is a big deal. There's nothing small about what God tells us to do that you do. There's nothing small about it at all. It's huge in the kingdom. You know, that can protect your life. It can give you a long life. It can do all kinds of stuff. So God values singing so much that he actually sings over you. He's the one who thought this thing through. Let me read this to you, and then I'll read to you an expanded translation from the Strong's Concordance. In Zephaniah 3.17, the Amplified, it says, The Lord your God in the midst of you. The Lord your God in the midst of you. A mighty one, a Savior who saves, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his silent satisfaction and in his love. And in his love, he will be silent and make no mention of past sins or even recall them. He will exalt over you with singing. That's God, right? That's how God feels about you. In, in other words, it's a staggering reality. This is a staggering reality. Listen to this. How many of you guys believe this stuff, by the way? Yeah. Amen. It's a staggering reality that God expresses his love for you. Watch now. He expresses his love for you emotionally with singing. Amen. Amen. Singing is an emotional expression. You know, so it's, it's, the high, it's the highest form of God saying, this is how I feel about you. I actually say, now listen to, listen to the expanded uh, Hebrew um, from the Strong's Concordance. The Lord thy God in the midst, the nearest or the center part of you, is mighty, a powerful warrior. He will save, he will free or deliver, he will rejoice, he will be bright, he will be radiant, he will be joyful over you with joy, exceeding gladness. He will rest in his love, he will joy, he will spin around, rejoicing over you with singing triumphant sounds and shouts. That's powerful. So, you know, I'm bringing in this subject, you can probably sense that, I'm bringing in the subject of singing, how singing brings protection, you know, against the enemy. You know, it's a powerful warfare tool. But when you and I sing, it, it, it appears that you don't sing alone. When, when you and I sing, Jesus sings with you. Listen to what it says. Hebrews 2.12. I will declare thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. So, so, so But you have to know this, right? So if you don't know these things, if you don't connect these dots, you'll never know, right? So you'll just sing, and you'll think, well, there's nothing happening here. I'm just doing my best singing. But that's not actually what's happening. If you know, if you can connect the dots, you won't forget this ever. If you can connect the dots that when you sing, Jesus is actually singing with you. So the enemy doesn't hear a solo. He hears a duet. Hallelujah. Amen. In some mystical way, although, you know, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, in some mysterious, some mystical way that we don't understand, He joins us when we start to sing praise. Hallelujah. Now, that, in, again, everything is, is in the spirit realm, right? So in the spirit realm, it's like, whoa. Listen, you know when Jesus was teaching his 13-year-olds in, year in the temple? They were astounded, the guys. They were not astounded because he could interpret the Scripture. Every kid at 13 in those days knew the Scripture. So that wasn't the big deal. What blew them away was this kid, if I could use that expression reverently, this little boy, he understood how to connect the dots that the Scriptures would make sense in terms of lifestyle. <laughs> this is life. They were hearing life. He could connect the dots. We have to connect the dots 
We don't just read stuff. We have to meditate, connect the dots. Take every scripture with weight. This is weighty stuff. This is for me. So when I sing, I don't sing alone. The, in the spirit realm, the enemy says, I'm hearing another voice. That's not just the voice of Tom. That's the voice of Tom and Jesus. A little more enthusiasm would have been great. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So there's a strong, a strong possibility when we sing the voice of the king is heard. Amen. So there's two kings of singing. You're a king and a priest, and then he's the king of kings. That means there's, 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 <laughs> there's tremendous authority is heard in the spirit realm when you sing. There's two kings singing. <laughs> there's you and him. Amen. The authority that is released. But if you know, if you connect the dots, if you don't connect the dots, you just sing, man. And you don't know because we've never read that scripture through and really understand what it means. Or we don't believe it because it sounds a little, you know. But it's true. Amen. Now, now this is the sound that changes things. This is the sound that changes things. It changes circumstances. It changes atmospheres. It changes churches, it changes towns, it changes nations. It's the voice of agreement between kings. Amen. It's the voice of agreement. It's the voice of agreement between kings. He's the king of kings and you're a king. God says, I can't do any better than that in terms of getting kings together. You know, but when kings... And what, what we sing is the victory. We're not singing for victory. We're singing of the victory. <laughs> that drives the devil crazy. Drives him crazy. He's saying they've connected the dots. You see, so, so the worship thing, thing is, is, is it's much bigger than singing for 20 minutes before somebody preaches. Amen. This is what's been missing from the church a lot of the time is we don't fully understand what the, how this stuff works. So we just sing and we get tired and nothing really happens. But when we can put it together, you know, you can see some examples of this. Is, is, uh, well, let, let, let's just go back to the, I made a statement there. Let me explain the statement. It says, this is the kind of sound that changes things, circumstances, atmospheres, churches, towns, and nations. This takes a bit of faith to believe what I've just said to you there. But, you know, <clears throat> when, when Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman, and, uh, and she brought up the subject, she says, well, you know, you Jews, you actually worship over there, which is Jerusalem. And we, because she was a Samaritan, she wasn't a, a Jew. She says, and us Samaritans, we worship over there, Mount Gerizim. So she brings up the subject of geography. We worship there. You Jews worship there. So Jesus sorts that thing out very quickly. He says, well, there's coming a time when you shall neither in Jerusalem nor Mount Gerizim worship, but you shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What Jesus was saying was this, lady, there's coming a time when it doesn't matter the geography where you worship. Because geography has now become subject to worship. Worship is not subject to geography. Amen. You don't have to go there to worship or go there to worship. So wherever you, what he's saying here is, lady, wherever you worship, in that place, you change the spiritual atmosphere in that place. Amen. Amen. That spiritual forces that has dominated that area, possibly for years and years and years, those spiritual forces come under the authority of the worship that is released in that place if you know how to connect the dots. If you know what's happening in the spirit realm, because everything, remember, is happening in the spirit realm. Amen. Very, very powerful. So I'll say that again. So he's, he's, not, he's, not, say, he's not saying that, that worship becomes subject to geography. He's not saying that. He's saying geography becomes sub, subject to worship. 
Amen. It's very powerful. So Jehoshaphat, I'll give you a couple of examples. Jehoshaphat identified the army who were, uh, they were it's interesting here. There's, there's an argument that this guy uses, uh, Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, when he starts to sing. The argument is a profound argument. I'll read it to you quickly. It says, without getting into the background, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 11, it says, how they are rewarding us. This is the enemies coming against them, right? How they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out. Now watch this. Underline this in your Bible. He says, the enemy's coming against us. He doesn't say here, he's talking to God, he doesn't say the enemy's coming against me and the nation. He says the enemy's coming against us. Amen? In other words, he's saying, God, <laughs> the enemy's coming against you and me. So he's drawing, he's drawing God into the fight. Amen? Listen to what he says. He says, the, how they are rewarding us, coming to throw us out of your possession. He says, the enemy's coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. The argument he's using is this. He's saying, God, the enemy is coming to kick us out of the inheritance that you've given us. That can't happen. In other words, God, we're in covenant. You're involved in this fight. The, the, I'm not doing this alone. And, and the, the Bible goes on to tell us that. That I'm not in this alone. I'm in this with you. He's basically saying, come on, God. You know, in the natural, I don't know how to get through this. But, but, but the enemy cannot steal our inheritance. Our inheritance. Amen. Because when you and I come into the kingdom... Which God is, is ours and which ours is God's, right? This is why, I mean, we, we, you know, when God asks us for 10%, we should give it with joy. <laughs> Come on, man. We shouldn't be struggling to tithe. We should be joyful in tithing. Amen? Because of the inheritance thing. Because then we don't want to go back to God and say, okay. So, so God says, okay, but I only asked you for 10% and you struggled with that. Now you're asking me for everything. You know, this is not fair. Do you know what I'm saying? God doesn't say that, but you know what I mean, right? So, so but, but this is all where it is. But then if you know you're doing that, then you've got a very strong point saying, you know, I've done my part, but God, now you do your part. Now, what is your inheritance? Your inheritance is every promise that God has given you in the Bible. Amen. That's your, inherit your inheritance. So, and, it, and then it goes on and it says, so what happened? It says, so it says, and, and so... God instructed them, and when they began, watch this, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against Mount Ammon, or Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. So, so it's interesting, the word there, when they just began to sing. They didn't have to drum it up. They didn't have to wind up the congregation to get in the spirit. If you know the principles, you don't have to wind them up to get in the Spirit. That's why we should come to church ready to praise and not be wound up. No, I'm not saying you do. But you know what I'm saying? A lot of churches, that we wind them up, get them in the Spirit, man, so they can praise the Lord. It's ridiculous. David, that was foreign to David. I mentioned that on Friday. He praised as a, as a response to God's presence, not to get God's presence. That would have been ridiculous to the Old Testament saints, to David. God was already there. We're not trying to get him. We're trying to respond to him. Amen. And so that's very, very powerful. So as soon as they began to sing, as soon as they just begun, the Holy Spirit acted in the spirit realm. Singing was enough to activate warriors, angelic hosts in the spirit realm to come against the enemy that was coming against them. Oh, hallelujah. So, so listen, so they needed mercy, and guess what they sang? Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. That was it. Praise ye, there wasn't about, you know, 15 choruses, 15 verses, we all got to try and remember. Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. The point is this, you get the results that you sing about. All they needed was mercy. 
So they're not going to go and sing about something else because it wasn't relevant. Amen? So I'm going to say that again. because Some of you get a little bit distracted there. So, so what result do you want? That's what you've got to sing. Okay. What result do you want? That's what you've got to sing. Amen? There's a principle right there. What do you guys need right now? We're surrounded by these areas. We need your mercy. We don't know what to do. Well, sing it, man. That's basically what God was saying. Well, sing it. They could have said, but God, why don't you just do something? God says, well, I've put principles in the earth, and singing is one of them. If you just sing, that's a principle I've put in there, that the, the angels will respond to that. <laughs> and they'll come against, and you don't have to do it for long, guys, because just do it. The enemy's right there. Just do it. So they began to sing. They just began to, sun, to sing. And the enemy came up against them and defeated all of them. In fact, they picked up the spoil. Um, so if you read through there, they picked up spoil. They, they, you know, they, it took three days in gathering up the spoil from the enemy. So, so effective warfare will always bring spoil into your hands. I want you to see this. This is how God works. God says, don't think for a minute that effective warfare will just ward off the enemy. What effective warfare will do will bring something to you once you've, you've done the thing that I told you to do. In other words, it will always add to you. Because our mindset is effective warfare will get rid of the enemy, get off my back. And God says, no, no, that's only half the message. The full message is that'll happen, but there's always rewards. You can read it in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Three days they picked up the spoil. They picked up the gold and the riches and the, you know, other jewels because the whole enemy was wiped out. Not one of them remained. Not one of the enemy remained. When God does warfare on your behalf, if you and I do these simple things, he will do it completely and totally. He will destroy every trace of the enemy that's coming against you. I'm preaching good to myself because I'm really get you know I'm getting this I'm getting it fresh again for myself you know so is this okay we're going a little bit a little bit longer um so I've got a few points here so it's interesting when you sing you know um you know yeah, there's a there's a story here that took me a while to understand um you know you know when Saul was demented by d demonic spirits and, uh, and, and actually, the servants knew this. Is that there's a young kid up the road, man. He plays his guitar. And uh, we've heard that when he plays, things happen. There's deliverance. You better, better get this guy. So they go and get young David, and David plays his harp. Now, it's, this is interesting. And it took me a while to really, and I f don't fully know if I understand it. Because I've been asked this in seminars so many times, and I've never had the right answer so many times. So the Bible clearly says there, clearly says that when David played with his hand, the demonic spirits left Saul. Now, the question I've often got is this. So, did he sing? What did he sing? And I says, it doesn't say that he sang. It doesn't say that he sang at all. He just played his instrument. Now, some people have a problem with that, and I, I struggled with that because I know the Word is the most powerful thing, right? The Word is the most, and singing is the most powerful thing. So, I, I did struggle with that, and I says, God, I need to try and understand this. How does it work? How do I answer some of these questions that come up at these seminars? You know, when, when people say, but, but you, are you sure he didn't sing? Well, the Bible clearly says that he just played. It's, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's clear. He just played his instrument. So in the spirit realm, the demons somehow responded just to the playing of an instrument. It's quite profound, you know. But then you go to the New Testament and you get the answers. I think you get the answers. Because when you look at the greatest instrument, the greatest instrument God has ever created, it is the human voice. Amen. Amen. It's the greatest instrument. So this, for me, would be equivalent, David playing his guitar, and the demons responded. 
The equivalent for that for me, my only understanding, maybe I need to get more understanding, and I'm sure I do. The equivalent for that for me would be singing in the Spirit. Amen? Singing in the Spirit. Demonic forces will leave. This is why it's so important to sing in the Spirit. Just make melody in your heart. That's what that's talking about. Make melody, melody inside. Amen? Have a melody inside. It's the greatest instrument known. And I believe that's equivalent to what happens when you start to sing in the Spirit or even just talk in the Spirit, but there's melody there. Demonic forces, they interpret that as get out of town. Let's go somewhere else. Does this make sense? Amen? Because a lot of people will say, oh, that's singing in the Spirit. That, you know, that's crazy stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy good. You know? <laughs> And so let me just go through another one, uh, um, and I'll just explain to you what happens here. So, so um, I've already said sing the results that you want. Here's another one, slightly different. And it's in, in Acts chapter 16, it's Paul and Silas. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everybody's chains were loosed. So Paul and Silas are in jail. And it's midnight, it's midnight, it's midnight. And they've been beaten up. They've got blood probably all over them from the beat up. There's probably rats running around. It's cold, probably damp. It's a miserable place to be. And Silas, I'm just making this bed up, so relax. Silas probably said to, to, to Paul, you know, here we are, serving, <laughs> serving the Lord and look where we end up. You know, this is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like... What? This is crazy, man. So what are we going to do now, great apostle of God? <laughs> what are we going to do now? Any, any ideas? Making this bit up, relax. And so Paul says, yeah, I do actually have an idea. He says, you know, I've been reading over there. Uh, I've been reading over there in the Psalms. There's a great verse over there, Silas. I think we should sing it. Okay, what is it? And so Paul must have said, well, it's appropriate. It's exactly appropriate to the situation that we're in. Because in Psalm 116, 119, verse 62, it says, At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of your righteous judgments. Amen. So he says, the solution to our problem has already been written. Amen. Come on, man. The solution to our problem has already been written. Why don't we sing what's been written? Come on, man. By Jesus' stripes you were healed. It's already been written, right? God took time to write that. He sent His Word and healed you and delivered you from all your troubles. Why don't we sing what's been written? And we'll get the result. Now watch this. This was a little revelation I got from myself. I don't know how true it is, but it's it's great thought. Is that because the word of God is alive, it there's no time barriers. It's not restricted to time at all. It's not restricted to time. So for example, when Jesus was on the cross two thousand years ago, right? But if you start to sing about that. By Jesus' stripes you were healed. That took place on the cross. Now watch this. This is just my little theory. I could be wrong. But it's almost as if that you are reenacting the very cross incident in your time. Just think about it. Amen. You're bringing which already taken place, but, but, but in God there's no time. So it's almost like forcing the devil to say, listen, right now, I'm, I'm in pain, but I want to tell you something. By Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Amen. That what took place 2,000 years ago is effective right now. It's as if I'm at the foot of the cross right now, and he's taking the blows for my sickness. Amen. Dealing with what's been written. We're nearly finished. I'll think, I think I'll close with this one. Our time's moving on. Um, 
Could, could we all go to this? This is a big one. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. I think you all know the scripture. There is, there is something about carrying the peace of God that is very important. Um, there's three areas of peace. By the way, every person carries a measure of peace or anxiety. Everybody does. So you need to choose your friends well. Amen. You can't be you can't be messing about with people who are anxious. You got to choose your friends well. You may say, "Well, I've got to befriend them." They're not a friend to you. You got to choose your friends well. This is really really important. Number one, you've got to have peace with God, which is spiritual peace. You've got to have peace with yourself, which is emotional peace. And you've got to have peace with people, which is relational peace. Now, getting back to this last scripture, and we'll close. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a portion of scripture you're probably all familiar with. It says there, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. That's in present tense. That's not in past tense. That's written in present tense. So God says, I know the thoughts that I'm, you could say, I'm presently thinking about you, Tom. Amen. Okay, so what are you thinking about me, Lord? And he says, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Amen. To give you a future and a hope. So watch this now. So, say, okay, God, what's happening right now? God says, I'm thinking about you. In fact, there's never a microsecond when he's not thinking about you. If God forgot about you for a microsecond, you'd be lost for an eternity. Amen. So, so, God, is, so, so God is thinking about you right now. So, okay, it's a great question. So, what is God thinking about right now? You, regarding you. Right now, as we stand here, in real time. What is God thinking about right now regarding you? Well, it's there. He says, I'm thinking of peace. What? We think about all kinds of stuff, but God says, I'm thinking about your peace right now. I'm not thinking in the past tense or in the future tense. I'm thinking in the now tense. Amen. To give you a future and a hope. So then he brings in, what he's, he's doing in the present time that is going to affect the future time. Amen. This is going to help your destiny. So he says, Tom, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm thinking about you, and I've got in mind your future, but I'm not thinking about your future. I'm thinking about your present. God, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about your peace. So what does that mean then? It means, Tom, you've got to get in sync with what I'm thinking. You've got to be at peace in the moment. This is a huge one. The enemy hates this one. You've got to be at peace in the moment. Because if you've got peace in the moment, in God, listen to what it does. This is powerful. It secures it secures your destiny. It secures your future, and it gives you a hope to reach it. Hallelujah. Amen? You're very quiet. So, so a peaceful state is a most profound state for the enemy to be inactive in your life. The peace of God that passes all understanding. This doesn't make any sense to anybody in any realm except God's realm. The enemy doesn't under How can this guy have peace? How can this woman have peace in the midst of a world that's gone crazy? How, 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 see, this is what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to steal your peace. All this stuff, this crazy stuff that's going on, he's trying to steal your peace. And if he steals your peace, you don't have a future. Amen. 
So if you've got peace in the present and you maintain that peace in the present, what happens is God starts to line up. He starts to line up circumstances, situations that will take you towards fulfilling destiny. He'll bring people across your path. I've seen it in my own life to get this message out to the, to the nations when there was no internet. People came across my path. I saw it in that book. People come across my path at the right time listening to the right things, saying the right things that would lead you to the next thing. So what he'll do is he'll set up stuff for you, for your future. And all of that is simply because you have secured peace in your life. I refuse to be anxious. And then you start thinking, thank God, I do have a future. I do have a hope. Things are going to be really good in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to have a quick prayer. Over you, and then I'll hand it back to Pastor. I want to first, first of all, thank you for coming out on a Sunday night. I know that the church doesn't normally have Sunday night meetings, so thank you so much for coming out tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm asking you just to imprint in our hearts and our minds, Father God, these uh, principles. These principles, Father God, that, uh, that the enemy is stopped in his tracks if we just apply some of these simple principles. We don't have to be warring. We have to stand, yes. But if you apply some of these principles, you'll start to see that the enemy will back off. Your children will be secure. You'll have a, a feeling of your children is going to be secure. Your grandchildren, everybody is going to benefit in your circle. One person can make a difference in a family, in a church, in a generation, in a city. People can make a huge difference. But we've got to have that peace. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank Him for peace right now. Thank Him for peace. Thank you, Father, for your peace right now. Father, I just ask you, Spirit, Embed these words in our minds and our hearts and let them bring forth life. Let there be a harvest that they bring forth in Jesus' mighty name. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There's nothing greater than the truth. It's the truth that sets you free. Amen. If you can take these truths, there will be a massive change in your life. We thank God for it. We thank God for his word. We thank God for the reverence that we have for him. I sense that reverence this morning in this house. We thank him for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.